democracy is the worst system besides the other systems. The phrase actually means that democracy at its worst is still better than any dictatorship. The claim does appear to complement the democratic form of government, but it really means it is better than the worst forms of government we know about. The claim democracy is the best of the known systems is as laudatory as saying Joe is the fastest swimmer in the pool today. The importance of his victory depends on the quality of the competition. The legitimacy of democracy depends on the alternatives it is compared to. If it is to be compared to fascism and other forms of dictatorship, it is the preferable model. The value of a democratic government is not challenged by monarchy, autocracy, and fascism, but when looked at in a broader context, where does the majority get the authority to pick a nation's leader? In most countries, a few urban centers determine the outcome of an election. What justifies the urban voter of a couple of metropolitan areas deciding who the leader will be? It is not difficult to understand how the first leaders got their authority. The first rulers were the most influential man in the tribe. The leader machismo made him similar to a god or the tribal god's representative. Eventually, the leader assumed the attributes of a god. Rulers of more advanced cultures claimed their office was ordained by God. The exercise of imperial power was claimed as the divine right of kings. In these earlier forms of government, the ruler's power was absolute. This was a matter of convenience as much as anything. Private ownership was the only ownership model understood. Even though practical considerations required the ruler to modify his absolutism to garner support, the ruler was considered the private owner of the realm and all in it. This private ownership model of government worked reasonably well so long as the ruler did not push the divinity aspect of his position overly. But as time went on and other classes gained more property and power, there was a call for the leader to share some of the administrative responsibilities, at least with the nobility and the top ranks of the military. The process of power sharing was difficult to stop once begun. The richer landowners wanted a say in how their taxes were spent. But permitting rich landowners a say in the affairs of state opened the door to lesser property owners. Eventually, the vote was extended to all male property owners. In time, being male was sufficient to give in one the vote. Eventually, the vote was given to women. In short, once the absolutism of the ruler was questioned and the process of power sharing was started, more and more people wanted a say in how the state was operated. The process of devolving power down to the base is known as subsidiarity. No decision able to be dealt with by a subordinate office is to be handled by a higher one. The first authority has precedence over the more central administrator. A less effective way to share power is known as the division of responsibilities. In the British model government is divided between monarchy, senate, and chamber. The U.S. divided power between the judiciary, the executive, and the Congress. However, these models are more about optics than reality. The British model has an independent judiciary, and the Congress in the U.S. is divided into Senate and the House of Representatives. The problem with the division of power is stalemate. Funding government is difficult in America if one party does not have control of Congress and the presidency. Inertia is seen in cooperatives. Every member is a sovereign power and every member wants their say and their voice heard. Democracies, in one sense, never wage war. To conduct a war a democracy assumes the form of a dictatorship. How easily this transformation is was made visible when COVID-19 hit. Canada and New Zealand were especially zealous in ensuring rights were rescinded and power centralized. In a blitzkrieg that astounded everyone, civil rights were all but eliminated. But the problem with centralized government is that the wrong person is the one to handle the problem. Which makes us question who has the right to rule if not a dictator and not some random majority. If the person with the gun or the army argues he has the right to make the rules and enforce them, or if a mob storms your store and proceeds to ransack it and say their actions are justified, how do you explain the supposed right is illegitimate and that the power to do does not provide sufficient justification for the doing? White people are a people who extend a hand of friendship to their enemies. White culture being infused with Christian ideals expressed in their actions and unfathomable faith in their fellow man. It was a faith often betrayed. By ending slavery, whites gave the descendants of slaves the power to turn on their emancipators. 
but a few bad experiences is not sufficient to make us return to the rule of war. The bad would like to drag the good down to their level. But the faithful must continue to seek legitimacy in what they do. There is no legitimate way for criminals to share stolen goods. We cannot find a way to justify having power over what we have no right to. The world is not ours and the physical things of this world do not belong to us. We have through various means and devices laid claim to land and water and even air that does not belong to us. The utilization of power to wrest authority from others betrays a philosophy of ownership that is invalid. The doctrine of power is the worst kind of circular reasoning. If you must kill to prove your point, your point is not grounded in reason. But then why ought reason to even matter? Why do we care if the use of power to decide matters can be legitimized? Perhaps compliance is sufficient and victory the end product of human existence. Perhaps our purpose is to discover who ends up with absolute power? But the power of the sword is not the greatest power on earth. The greater power is faith. The power of the gun requires the people be divided. At minimum the guy with the gun has to be an opponent of those who are in front of him. The gun is not a weapon, unless the person with it is a weapon. The problem is not the gun, the problem is the person holding it. All the guns and other implements of destruction are just accoutrements. Guns make it possible to take power and power makes it possible to gain property, but faith provides an easier and safer route to what we want. Power is wrong because power cannot be justified. Power cannot be justified as a means to an end because faith is stronger. If power gives us access to property, it gives us access to the wrong sorts of property. Owning land and other assets is wrong because we did not create it. Claiming things that are not ours destroys faith and this makes us weaker in the long run. Putting others at risk of the seizure of what is theirs is not a good way to encourage productivity. If people think what they have will be stolen, they will not produce surplus to their needs. The exercise of power depresses economic activity because power increases the level of risk we are exposed to. The possibility that what you work for could be taken, because you lack sufficient power to protect what you created, depresses productivity. The fact that whites made themselves accountable and provided guarantees that reduced risk for others gave everyone a greater faith in the future. It was the faith of white people that gave them an advantage in competition with other races and cultures. That whites are law-abiding is not the issue, so are other cultures. It is the level of faith that Western peoples were able to have in each other that made them victorious in combat and in economics and other areas. Faith is the most powerful force in the universe. But to experience faith we have to have faith. The first and foremost quality we can have is to be faithful. Only the faithful can experience faith. If you are not faithful in your dealings with others, they will not have faith in you, and you will not be able to have faith in them. The sign of faith or the measure of faith is the level of trust we have in each other and more importantly in communities of faith. Works of faith build communities of faith, and this is trusts. We do not have faith if we do not trust each other. And if there is no trust there is no community of faith. We invest a lot of time and resources in those whom we trust. These works of faith build up trust. If we do not trust someone, we protect ourselves from them. We work at isolating ourselves from the risk the unfaithful represent. Some people claim there is a social contract. This is not so, but we are expected to keep our word and to be trustworthy. If we break our faith, it is not the breaking of a social contract so much as proving you cannot be trusted. The untrustworthy person is edged out of the body politic. This is why some populations become socially excluded. They are not people anyone thinks worthy of trust. Not even the most unfaithful person trusts someone else who has proven to be untrustworthy. These excluded persons end up in an isolated community and they are always poor. A trust is a community of faith. Trusts represent the idea that those who are faithful can be invested in and worked with. Those who are faithful earn the right to our trust. In the vernacular, a community of faith is considered a church. Building up the community of faith is building the church, and to build the church is to build trust. The trust we express becomes a community that has the form and function of a trust. A trust is the fruit that comes from works of faith. 
It is faith that replaces democracy because democracies always pose a risk to the faithful. Democracies can be taken over by a majority that has no faith. Trusts are communities of faith built by people of faith. Trusts are the systematic elimination of risk for those who have faith. The first step in eliminating risk is to eliminate claims on property that does not belong to us. All commercial assets must be liquidated through transferring these to the church, or in the language of this essay, the trust. The trust compensates the charitable behest with the issue of preferred shares deposited in the trust account of the benefactor. All work and all donations of commercial assets provides value to the trust which permits it to issue an equal quantity of preferred shares. These are deposited in the account of the one doing the work of faith. The person of faith works and buys from the trust using the sign of faith, the preferred shares. Purchases results in a debit to the trust account and sales of assets or of labor results in a credit to the trust account. As a unit of account preferred shares are referred to as prefers which is a contraction of preferred shares and designated by the symbol when written.